Nisa, you, you can start it. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk, everyone. And thanks to the organizers of the ARL seminar for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I'll be talking about a series of uh, papers co-authored with uh, Masatoshi on the theme of statistically efficient offline reinforcement learning. So to motivate my talk, to motivate my talk, I want to start by talking about the potential for reinforcement learning in medicine. Um, so in particular, consider the case of sepsis, which is when the body has an extreme reaction to an infection. Sepsis is also a leading cause of death, of death worldwide. And despite this very morbid status, it's actually not quite clear what's the best treatment plan to manage uh, sepsis. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of different interventions that doctors uh, can take uh, to help uh, sepsis patients, like uh, apply vasosuppressors, give IV fluids, take away IV fluids, and there's uh, potentially a lot of heterogeneity in how these interventions affect different patients, uh, showing different uh, variety of subtle symptoms and different uh, progression of their sepsis. So while there just may be too many patterns for us to comprehend, maybe this is a great opportunity for reinforcement learning. So indeed, in recent years, we've seen a lot of success uh, of reinforcement learning in playing video games or uh, teaching a robotic hand how to solve uh, the Rubik's Cube. But video games are somewhat different, right? So here we can try things out. We can jump here, throw a fireball there, and see what happens. Every once in a while, Mario is going to die. We can just restart the game and try over. In medicine, things are different. All right, we can't just uh, pull the tubes on this poor guy just to see what happens. Uh, we have to take care with every action that we take. So in medicine and in other high stakes domains, exploration is going to be necessarily quite limited and we won't have any reliable simulators. Instead, we have to rely on existing data. So instead of proposing a policy, playing it out, seeing what happens and then tweaking it, uh, we are going to have data from a different policy. Essentially, if we're thinking about medicine, maybe uh, we can think about the mixture of doctors at the hospital uh, as being the uh, policy that's generating, you know, that's generating the electronic health records. Luckily, there's a lot of EHR data, so there's a lot of potential of leveraging it. The question is how to do it correctly. So one example of a, uh, of a work that kind of tried to do something along those lines is this Nature Medicine paper that uh, took EHR data from uh, ICUs and applied RL to it in order to learn an algorithm for treating sepsis. This unfortunately was met with quite a bit of scrutiny and skepticism from both the RL community and the medical community. And you know, I would summarize it as essentially the biggest gripe here was that there was, uh, that this was kind of unreliable due to something known as the curse of horizon. So essentially what the Komorovsky et al. did to evaluate how well their algorithm is doing is they did the following. Uh, for each patient in the data set uh, that they derived from ICU data, uh, they asked, you know, what would our algorithm do? Maybe over here we apply mechanical ventilation, over here we give sedation, but over here we don't give vasosuppressors. And if uh, the patient in the data set followed the exact same trajectory, then we keep it. If not, we throw it away. Uh, and we keep it and then we use the, the result to score our algorithm. And what you can see is as the horizon is, grow long, is going to grow long and there's gonna be more of these points where we make a decision and throw some data out and keep other data, the amount of data that we're left with in the end is gonna shrink geometrically. And in the end, we're gonna be left with almost nothing. So it's gonna be very unreliable because essentially our sample sizes are tiny. Uh, so the question uh, I wanted to ask was, well, is that it? Uh, is it kind of doomed uh, to do offline RL? And so what I want to try and, and do to overcome this is to think about how does uh, problem structure allow us to go beyond this? How can we leverage problem structure to make better estimates and uh, inference and down the line, maybe learning as well. In particular, like maybe our problem has Markovian structure or time invariance or ergodicity. And the question is, what does this do for the fundamental limits of offline reinforcement learning? And the theme kind of, of what I'm going to talk about is, well, we only have the data that we have, right? We don't have simulation, we don't have experimentation, we just have the data. So we better use it to its most, right? That is, we better use it efficiently. But actually, what, efficient, what is efficient is actually going to be very intimately related to what structure we assume on the problem. So what we did in this uh, series of works is we studied uh, a variety of efficiency limits in off-policy uh, offline reinforcement learning problems in Markov decision uh, processes. And we did it for the first time in this model. Uh, 
in the MVP model. And what this did is it provides insight into when does this curse uh, of a horizon actually bite. Uh, and it paints it rather as a problem dependent phenomenon. Uh, you know, what structure you assume tells you what is the most efficient and tells you what is feasible. When is it feasible to get variance that is not exploding with horizon? Uh, it's not really estimator dependent. Uh, and so the question is, so what we're gonna see is that in certain settings, the efficiency limit is actually pointing in the direction of, well, there is actually hope to estimate the policy value here. And then uh, to achieve this, uh, we provide the first efficient estimators for both policy value and policy gradient from off policy data in the MVP model. And we show that if you take a gradient ascent steps in the direction of this efficiently estimated gradient, we can also give you some policy learning guarantees. So here's a layout for the talk for today. So I'm going to start by uh, setting up the problem and saying exactly what it is that we're trying to get at and what does efficiency mean. Uh, then I will give a very high level overview summary of our results into, on the efficiency bounds. And then I will talk about how to actually achieve these bounds uh, in off policy evaluation via a new algorithm that we call double reinforcement learning. Then I will talk about off policy gradient estimation and what it implies for policy learning. And I will end with some experimental results. Okay, so the model that we're going to deal with today is essentially the central model for reinforcement learning, which is the Markov decision process, or MDP. Uh, in an MDP, we have an agent interacting with an environment, essentially. So the agent here can be maybe wh who's ever, whoever is playing uh, the video game, whether it's a human or a machine, uh, and the environment is the Mario game. Or the agent can be a doctor, and the environment is this patient, the body of this patient. What happens when we do different things? How does the health of this patient evolve? Uh, and the model is as follows. At each round, the agent is going to see the state of the environment, ST. And depending on the state, uh, she's going to take an action. So the action is simply going to be described by uh, uh, the policy, which is just a distribution of actions given states. After taking a particular action, uh, the environment is going to uh, react by advancing to a new state, which is drawn from a transition distribution that depends on the current state and the action that we took in it. And there's also going to be a reward uh, omitted, omitted that depends on the current state and action. And then we proceed to the next round. And essentially what we want is we want to maximize the rewards. So specifically, if we think about uh, the MDP, the problem here, the environment is described by an initial distribution, a transition distribution, and a reward distribution. If to this, we also uh, specify a policy, that is, what are we gonna do in every state? These two things together is going to give us a joint distribution over trajectories. That is over the random variables, S0, A0, R0, S1, A1, etc. cetera. Uh, and the way it does this is simply you just multiply the probabilities and it gives you a distribution over this. Okay, so now we have a joint distribution and I'm gonna call this distribution P sub pi to highlight its dependence on the policy that we choose to play, pi. Okay, and then the policy value is simply going to be the average discounted reward when the rewards are you know, drawn from trajectories that we get when we play policy pi. So simply the expectation of these RTs according to this distribution uh, for pi. And we can also think about the long run average rewards, which is simply the limit of this thing as t is going to infinity. And notice, you know, I'm normalizing here. So gamma here is a discount factor. Um, and the off policy evaluation task is as follows. If you give me a specified policy pi, it, try to estimate the value of this policy uh, when the data that you get is n observations of t long trajectories from playing a different policy pi v the behavior policy. In pi b, the behavior policy may be known or unknown. Um, uh, sorry, this should say pi b, not p pi b. Uh, for now, I'm just gonna focus on pi b being known. Everything is essentially the same if pi b is not known. And the key difficulty in uh, off policy evaluation is that the expectation we wanna estimate is respect to one distribution, but the data that we get is from a different distribution. So we can't just take simple sample averages. Uh, that was for evaluation. What about for learning? Well, suppose we are given a policy class parameterized by some parameter theta. And let's define, you know, value of theta as the value of the theta policy. 
And then the off policy gradient problem is uh, again, estimate uh, from N observations of, of T long trajectories from playing a behavior policy pi B, now estimate the gradient of the policy value. So the gradient of the policy value with respect to the, param to the policy parameter theta. Uh, we can actually rewrite the policy gradient in a more convenient fashion as again, an expectation that's kind of like this uh, discounted average, but now we multiply by this new variable G, which is the policy score. So this is just a trick where you multiply and divide by uh, uh, the policy, and then you can uh, rewrite it to this expectation. Essentially, this gradient, uh, when we do this, is taking a gradient with respect to the policy here. So that's why we have to play this trick. And this uh, G is known as the policy score. It's the gradient of the log of the policy. And again, the key difficulty is uh, the policy gradient is an expectation with respect to one distribution. The data is coming from a different distribution. And uh, why uh, policy gradients? Well, policy gradients uh, can be used for policy learning simply by doing gradient ascent in the direction of the estimated gradients and then updating theta uh, at each step. And uh, in uh, the online settings uh, where we can do experimentation or we can do some simulation to kick things off, policy gradient methods have actually been uh, the methods that have driven a lot of the recent uh, successes in reinforcement learning. So what are some existing approaches uh, to these problems? And I'm just going to give, again, a very abridged uh, view of this. There's a whole huge literature on this stuff. Uh, by not mentioning any one work, I'm not trying to minimize any of it. I'm just trying to be kind of succinct and try to be as, as, as you know, somewhat self-contained uh, in this talk. Uh, so I'll just you know, talk about kind of uh, general themes for existing approaches. So one approach to uh, kind of one of the most direct approaches to off-policy evaluation is uh, the sequential importance sampling or SAS estimator. So the SAS estimator uses these cumulative density ratios, which is the product uh, up to any time index little t of, this instant, of these instantaneous density ratios between how would the target policy act in the observed state and how would the behavior policy act in the observed state. And what these uh, density ratios do is essentially they just change measure from expectations under uh, behavior policy to expectations under the target policy. So that uh, when we take empirical expectations of this quantity, so this exactly looks like uh, J theta, except that we, it added this uh, lambda t, this cumulative density ratio here, and we're taking empirical expectations. So when I say E sub n, I simply mean the sample average over your n data points. So when you take empirical uh, expectations, that looks like an expectation with respect to the data generating distribution. So adding this lambda is essentially just changing from one uh, distribution to the target distribution. So that's one approach. Uh, another thing you do is you could take this SAS estimator and add a control variant. So this leads to uh, uh, what's known as the W robust estimator. And the reason I'm putting this quotes, the DR estimator, is because there's a lot of things that are W robust. Um, we're going to talk about something else that's W robust. Well, in the context of reinforcement learning, this particular estimator has been just called DR. So when people say DR in RL, they're referring to this thing. So that's why I put it in quotes. So it says take the SAS estimator and add an additive control variant. So here we're adding the Q function as a control variant. And the Q function is simply the uh, average cost to discounted average cost to go uh, from uh, time t when we're in state t and action t. And you can either think about this thing, uh, and of course, when we follow uh, pi theta. You can either think about this thing as a function of stat, or you can think about it as a random variable because it's measurable with respect to the random variable stat. So I'm just going to be very kind of uh, use a kind of shorthand and write it as qt and omit the. Uh, the, the arguments ST80 to the Q function. Here Q hat is just an estimator for the Q function. We don't actually know the Q function, so we estimate it and we plug it in as a control variance. Uh, and notice that in the infinite horizon setting, when T is equal to infinity, uh, because everything just looks the same from any point, if you look in, far into the future, uh, these Q functions are essentially independent of the index T. So there's a lot of variants of this DR estimator. There's different ways to choose the a control variant. You don't have to plug in an estimate. You can try and optimize it or do other things. Uh, but you know, I won't talk too much about that. When it comes to off-policy gradient, 
uh, you can play the same uh, SAS trick there too and simply take the expectation that was defining the policy gradient, add a lambda and change the expectation to an empirical expectation. So this leads to something that sometimes we call uh, reinforce. Uh, you can also reformulate this in terms of the Q function. This leads to something called off pack, or sometimes this thing is actually just called policy gradient or off policy gradient, uh, even though it's just one estimator. And essentially, all of these estimators are going to suffer from this uh, curse of horizon. So here is a very kind of naive, sketchy view of it. Uh, we're going to be a bit more uh, rigorous about it later on. Essentially, if the instantaneous density ratios uh, are some constant, right? So of course, if the density ratios are one, that's exactly the setting where the target policy is the same as the, uh, as the behavior policy, and we're essentially doing on policy learning. Uh, if, it's, uh, if they're different, then this ratio will be sometimes smaller than one, sometimes bigger than one. Uh, generically, if it has a you know, kind of a moment uh, C, it's still bounded, uh, then what we're going to get is that these cumulative density ratios are gonna look like C to the T. So they're gonna explode exponentially in T, and all of these uh, estimators above are going to uh, have variance that explodes exponentially in the uh, horizon capital T. And in particular, we'll have infinite variance when, uh, capital, when the horizon is infinite. So the question is, how to break this? Right? So in the beginning, I mentioned, you know, maybe let's try and be efficient. Maybe if we're efficient, we can do better than this. So what does efficiency mean? So again, I'm just going to give a very brief uh, overview of efficiency theory just to be self-contained. Um, so it goes something like this. Suppose we have a model M that is simply a set of possible uh, data generating distributions, uh, blackboard P. And we have a parameter of interest tau, which is just a function from the DGP uh, to R, right? It's just some aspect of the DGP that we care about. Uh, then if we're given IID data, so just data XI's observations that are IID from this DGP, and the DGP is just some element in the model, what we want is a good estimator that's going to be a function of the data, and it should be a good estimator for the true value of the parameter, which depends on the true DGP. And we want to use the data the most, essentially. Uh, so the essentially one of the punchlines of semi-parametric efficiency is the following. It says that any estimator that is going to work for all instances in the model, or more technically, is a regular estimator with respect to the model. Okay, so if it works for all instances, then for each instance, it must satisfy the following. If you look at its MSE, the mean squared error, and we scale it up by M, then the limit infimum of this has to be at least some quantity, which we call the efficiency bound. And the efficiency bound is uh, the expectation of some function squared, and this function is known as the efficient influence function, and it can be thought of as a derivative of uh, the parameter with respect to the DGP. Okay, so it says that you can't beat this. If you work for all things in the model, then for each thing in the model, you will be lower bounded by this uh, mean squared error lower bound. And so how does this apply to our problem? Well, for us, the target parameter is either going to be the policy value or the policy gradient, and the model is going to be the set of all distributions of our trajectories when essentially the behavior policy is fixed and the MDP could vary arbitrarily. Okay, so for all possible MDPs, because we don't know what the MDP is. So that's the model. And that's what we're going to be working with. But it's actually going to be quite insightful to think about what happens when we consider bigger models, right? We consider bigger models, the efficiency bound is going to be higher. Uh, maybe there's settings where there, this is actually harder. So in particular, we can, you know, we started with this uh, Markov decision process model. We can think about uh, more relaxed versions of it. For example, we can let the transition, reward, and action distributions uh, depend on, uh, on time. So it could be a time-varying Markov decision process. I'm going to call that a TMDP. Uh, we can relax this further and make and allow every state's reward and action to depend on the whole history of states and action. I'm going to call this the non-Markov decision process or NMDP because it doesn't have this Markovian assumption that, you know, once I condition on state, I break away from the past, I break away the, the future. Okay, so we have this kind of nested uh, models. So now what can we say about these uh, different models and what happens in these different models? So I'm going to give a very kind of thousand foot uh, high level overview of our results because there's a lot of uh, 
uh, notation and equations. So I'll just give you kind of the overall structure of the results and, and the most important punchlines from them. So let's focus uh, uh, for simplicity on the infinite horizon setting for either off policy evaluation or off policy gradient estimation. Either one, the, the kind of the results are very similar. And the setting is going to be as follows. We're going to observe n trajectories, each of length t, from the behavior policy. And we want to estimate the infinite uh, horizon long run discounted average uh, value of a given policy pi. So in the NMDP model, what we can show is that the efficient MSE is actually infinity um, as long as these instantaneous ratios are far away, sufficiently far away from one. So imagine that gamma is 0.9. So one over gamma is like 1.1. And then this says that if rho t, in terms of some moments of rho t, is at least like 1.1. Remember, it's one when the uh, behavior, when the, when the policies are very, very similar. Then necessarily, the efficiency bound is infinity. What does that mean? It means there's essentially no hope. If you're trying to work for all things in the NMDP, it's just lost. There's no way you can uh, you can uh, break the curse of horizon. You're going to be uh, cursed uh, by this uh, by this thing. However, if uh, these policies are close enough, right? Essentially, if this thing is smaller than 1.1, um, if these uh, cumulative density ratios don't grow too fast, then you can get the efficient MEC that's on the order of one over n. Uh, but I put a little uh, video game character here because this is essentially like the on policy set. This is essentially saying the target policy is so similar to the behavior policy that you're essentially doing on policy learning for all intents and purposes. Because, you know, any, any differences between the policies is being washed out by the uh, discount factor. So essentially what we're saying is NMDP, forget it. You know, it's for long horizons, there's no hope. What about the TMDP? Okay, so time varying markup decision process. There, instead of requiring that the uh, cumulative uh, density ratios don't grow too fast, we actually only need that their marginalization with respect to STAT doesn't grow too fast in order to get this finite efficiency bound. Okay, so the question is when can we guarantee it? Well, actually, this is very hard to break. This will almost always hold. In particular, if you have a um, transition and reward probabilities that uh, that are uh, uh, time invariant and your policy is time invariant, you will always have that this thing is going to be bounded. It's going to be big O of one. So it's never necessarily going to be um, satisfied this condition and you're going to be able to break the curse of horizon. But to do that, we kind of argue that it's an MDP. It's time invariant in order to argue, okay, this thing should be bounded. So in some sense, yes, you're breaking the curse of horizon, but it's just a really crappy efficiency bound because if you're assuming MDP structure, you should leverage MDP structure to its mostest and get something that's efficient. So what happens in the MDP model? Okay, when things are um, time invariant, so all the transition and reward probabilities are invariant over time. In that case, actually the efficient MSC should scale on a com in a completely different way because now not it's not that every trajectory is kind of informative, but really every transition is informative. So we actually have NT transitions uh, when we observe N trajectories of length T. So the efficient MSC should really scale like one over NT. And uh, all we need here is we actually don't need N going to infinity. We can have a single trajectory where the length of the trajectory is going to infinity as long as these trajectories are ergodic, okay? So that uh, we're kind of learning, exploring uh, all areas. In that case, we should be able to achieve um, uh, an efficient MSC of the scale of one over NT. So let's clean up this table a little bit and focus on just the punchlines. So NMDP, hopeless. You're gonna be cursed by the curse of horizon. TMDP, you can uh, overcome the curse of horizon, but it's kind of a crappy rate. Uh, if you really are in an MDP model, you should get a rate that is, you know, orders better, right? One over N times T. So the question is now, how to capitalize on this and how to achieve something that has this very nice rate. So next I'm gonna talk about an algorithm that tries to do that. It has to do efficient off policy evaluation. And just to give an overview of our efficient estimation method results uh, before delving into an example, they all kind of take the following flavor. Uh, in our efficiency analysis, 
what we did is we derived the efficient influence function. So here we actually derived the EIF uh, for each of the cases, whether it's MDP, TMDP, uh, or MDP, um, whether we're looking at uh, policy value or policy gradient, whether the horizon is infinite or finite. Uh, for each of those cases, we get an EIF. In all of those cases, the EAF is going to involve some unknown nuisances. So it can be written as um, some function of the data that depends on some unknown nuisances that depend on the instance minus the target parameter. So tau for us, remember, is either policy value or policy gradient. So what are the nuisances depends on the case, but actually one of the nuisances that appear in all of the cases is the Q function. Okay? So this thing depends on the Q function. So the Q function is not known. That's why it's a nuisance. So if we knew all these nuisances, like the Q function, then taking sample average of this phi would be an efficient estimator. And our analysis gave us phi, so that would work. But the nuisances eta are not known. So one idea is estimate the nuisances, right? Estimate the Q function in some way and plug it in and take the sample average. Uh, so this is kind of uh, generally the, the idea, but we have to make sure that this works. So what we uh, do is we actually prove that uh, all of these EIFs satisfy a special double robustness property. So for example, in the case of policy evaluation, there's always two nuisances. So let's just uh, are, you know, generically call them eta one and eta two. And we show that whether you take the expectation of phi with eta one correct and eta two just anything, or you do the opposite, eta one is just whatever, but eta two is correct. In either case, uh, the expectation is, is equal to tau. Um, so this is what's known as double robustness. There's a different situation for off policy gradient that I'll talk about. And what this implies, it implies something known as Neiman orthogonality, essentially that uh, this type of estimate is going to be very insensitive to errors in the nuisance estimator. So even if you get small errors, it's okay. It's gonna wash out in the end when you take an average. Uh, in particular, to enable uh, very flexible machine learning estimators for eta hat in particular, in order to avoid making sort of the metric entropy conditions on the estimators and saying, you know, just a black box, no assumptions. What we can do is we could use a cross-fitting technique. So this is also something uh, that's, uh, this is something known as a double machine learning, which is, uh, was proposed recently. Um, and that allows us to use very flexible estimators for eta hat. Essentially, what I mean by enables to use it, it means that the results don't require anything about these estimators. Again, we're gonna have a special case for infinite horizon, and the result uh, that we get from all of this is that we get efficient estimation uh, via an algorithm we call double reinforcement learning. So this is kind of an analogy to double machine learning. So these nuisances are learned using reinforcement learning because it's Q functions, et cetera. So hence we call it double reinforcement learning because we use you know, flexible reinforcement learning algorithms to learn these nuisances. So here's how it would go, for example, for uh, off policy evaluation in infinite horizon MDP. So step one is to split the data into folds. Um, so for example, if we have many trajectories, we can just split into two folds across trajectories. Uh, but if we have only one trajectory uh, that is growing very, very long, we actually need to do a different trick. Uh, so let me focus on this case of having one long trajectory. Then we actually split it into four folds because the idea is that the folds should look independent of one another. So what's gonna happen is that adjacent folds are gonna look dependent because this is a single trajectory of dependent data. But as uh, these folds grow, as this gap D1 grows, D0 is gonna look more and more independent of D3. Okay, so notice I gave these kind of finding numberings, zero, one, three, two, and we'll see uh, soon why. Okay, so we split the data into folds. And then uh, let's define, we need to define some things. So let W of S be the ratio between the gamma discounted average visitation distribution at state S under the target policy, divided by the undiscounted stationary distribution at S under the behavior policy. So this is actually slightly different. If you're familiar with this paper, Liu et al from Europe's 2018. So this is different from uh, their density ratio that they use. Uh, this is kind of the one that should be, that arises in the efficiency analysis. Um, so then what you do is in each fold, you're gonna construct estimators for W and for Q based only on training data inside the fold. Okay, and I put a little star here because I didn't tell you how to construct these estimators. Uh, you know, what is the machine learning method or reinforcement learning method you're gonna use here? Uh, but we're gonna put this aside for now. 
And then what you do is as follows, your estimator is simply going to be, you take the average over your very long trajectory of this function, which takes, uh, which takes state action reward next state. So we look at our trajectory and for each state action reward next state, we plug it into phi. And phi also cares about uh, the w function and the eq function. So what we plug in there is going to be the estimates that we fit on the fold that's far away. Okay, so when we're uh, doing something on a transition s a r next s uh, that is in d3, we're going to use nuisances estimated on d0. And when we do the uh, average of something in d1, we're going to use nuisances uh, that were fitted in d2 to make sure that there is this separation between the average that the the suggestions that we're averaging over and the uh, nuisance. And then what we can show is the following. If our, uh, both the behavior and the target policies induce Harris ergodic chains on the Markov chain of, of state action reward, uh, then we can have the following. If the Q functions are estimated at a rate faster than alpha one, the W functions are estimated at a rate faster than alpha two, and if these alphas sum to at least a half, and we have some mixing conditions, then our estimator is going to be asymptotically normal with asymptotic variance given by the efficiency bound. Okay, so in other words, it's efficient and asymptotically normal. And uh, the key feature of this theorem is that we're making no assumptions on Q hat and W hat, right? There could be anything, all we want is slow rate. So we make no kind of entropy conditions on it. We can use some black box machine learning. We just need rates. And in particular, we need slow rates, like alpha one and alpha two equal to a quarter would satisfy all these conditions. But you can have other things, uh, you can have any things that kind of uh, allow for this trade-off. They're just, it's just that their sum has to be at least a half. We can even show that we have sort of a, a double robustness guarantee that even if one of these, uh, these uh, estimators is consistent, but not the other, we are still uh, consistent. So we can kind of draw this in a Venn diagram where each circle is essentially where each of these uh, estimators is consistent. So if either is consistent, where we are consistent, and if both are consistent at slow rates, then we're going to be efficient. So red, efficient, blue, consistent. Uh, and there's a bunch of other results in the paper, uh, such as uh, efficiency in the different models, efficiency under other conditions on the estimators, finite sample guarantees, not just asymptotic guarantees, uh, results for finite horizon, uh, what happens if the behavior policy is unknown, and kind of discussing the inefficiency of doing anything else. So remember I put a star on construct an estimator, it didn't tell you how, so let me just briefly, briefly discuss how you might do that. So actually W and Q can both be defined in terms of conditional moment uh, restrictions. So W solves this conditional moment restriction, Q solves this one, so what you can do is you can estimate, if you want to do some parametric estimation, you could do this using, say, a uh, GMM method, generalized method of moments. Or if you want to do this non-parametrically, you could use a sieve, since you just grow a basis expansion. And in the paper, we provide rates for this. Uh, but in practice, you might want to use, uh, you know, more flexible machine learning -y, uh, models for WMQ, like neural networks. In that case, uh, I would propose to use a, a method uh, that we proposed recently in a uh, paper in Neurox in 2019 that we call deep GMM, which essentially reformulates this uh, conditional moment restriction uh, so solution as a saddle point problem, uh, which allows us to then solve it using neural nets. Uh, but I won't go into that too much because I want to talk uh, about policy gradients and policy learning. Um, so what about uh, efficient estimation of policy gradients? So here, there's actually more nuisances, not just Q and W. We also have to think about uh, these new nuisances, DQ and DW. So I'm just gonna find DQ to be the gradient with respect to theta of Q. And DW is the gradient with respect to theta of W. So now we have four nuisances. And the reason for this is the efficiency analysis shows that the uh, EAF is gonna have these four nuisances in there. So not just Q and W, now we have Q, W, DQ, DW. And the estimation technique is going to be very, very similar to before. We're going to do this cross-fold estimation uh, trick uh, to estimate all the nuisances and plug them in into folds that look independent of where we estimated, uh, and then take the average over the whole data. And uh, you know, we're just going to plug it into the EAF that we derived for this case, the OPG case. And then we can show the following efficiency result. 
if the w functions are estimated at rates faster than alpha w, uh, dw with rates beta w, q by rates alpha q, dq by rates beta q. And if, and if the minimum over the rates for w and dw plus the minimum of the rates of q or dq is at least a half, then again, we have asymptotic normality and efficiency. Okay, so uh, for example, if all of these are a quarter, then it satisfies this condition. Okay, so we assume nothing else. So again, we could use very flexible machine learning models, uh, learn this in any, any what way, as long as we have these rates, uh, one quarter works, other things, anything essentially that satisfies uh, this uh, trade-off will be okay. From the robustness point of view, we actually have a kind of a special situation here, uh, only kind of a three-way double robustness. So what we can show is that we have consistency as long as one of the following three conditions holds. If W and DW are well specified, or as that is are consistent, if W and Q are consistent, or Q and DQ are consistent, uh, then we will have consistency. Of course, if they're all consistent at slow rates, then we will have efficiency. So blue consistency, red efficiency. It turns out that it's not enough to be consistent uh, with respect to DW and DQ. That would not give you consistency. And um, you know, one way to kind of see that is, um, you know, I don't have the equation on the, on the slide because it's a little complicated, but it involves the fact that there is kind of a DV nuisance, uh, uh, the derivative, the gradient of the value function. And the gradient of the value function involves both DQ and Q because of a, of a product rule. Uh, so if you have DQ and DW, you still need DV, but for DV, you need Q, okay? So that's why you don't get consistency in this case. Uh, what about policy learning? Well, what we can do with the uh, estimated gradient is then we could take gradient ascent. Okay, so consider the following efficiently estimated gradient ascent algorithm where we do the following. We start somewhere with some theta. Then we're going to estimate the gradient as theta using our efficient estimator for the off-policy gradient. We're going to take a step in this direction. Okay, so we're going to move theta i in the direction of the gradient with step size alpha i. And we're going to make sure to project it back to the space of uh, policy parameters. And that's going to be our next, uh, our next policy parameter, theta i plus 1. And then we're going to keep repeating this for k steps. What's our output? What is our final learned policy? Our learned policy is going to be, it's a little bit funny. It's going to be something like this. It's, uh, now we have these k iterates. And we're going to return the ith iterate with probability that's proportional to the ith step size. And that's going to be the policy we return. OK. So what can we say about such a procedure? Uh, we can actually show the following. Um, if the policy value is differentiable in theta and it's m smooth, if the step sizes are sufficiently small, if the efficient influence function is differentiable with bottom gradient, and if the uh, policy parameter space is compact, then with high probability, the uh, policy that we return, theta hat, is going to have a policy gradient with a small norm, okay? So this is the true policy gradient of it. So it's gonna look like uh, some term like uh, one over the number of steps plus a term involving uh, the uh, probability guarantee over KMT. Um, and so this essentially says that theta hat is, is nearly a stationary point uh, in this optimization of J theta. And uh, in particular, if we choose K in a particular way to be slightly faster than NT, and if J is concave, we can actually translate in this into a regret guarantee that says the regret of our uh, estimated policy is something like one over squared NT with some log terms. Okay, so uh, in the last uh, few minutes, I'll just give you kind of a quick overview of some experimental results. Um, and the first experimental results are in these open AI gym environments. Uh, and here we're focusing on just the finite horizon problem. And here we look at two open AI gym environments. One is this mountain car environment, where this car, you're going to press or not press the gas, and you want to gain enough momentum to get over the hill and get to your goal. Uh, another is the classic cliff walk, where you're trying to walk from the beginning to the end without walking off the cliff. And um, and here what we compare is a variety of things. So some things that actually leverage 
the uh, Markovian structure like uh, DRL in the uh, TMDP model versus other things like important sampling or DR or direct method or marginalized importance sampling. And what we see is that leveraging Markovianus uh, gives us big improvements. In addition, even if we leverage Markovianus and do something like marginalized importance sampling, being efficient uh, doing something like DRL is uh, really important. So what's important is leverage the structure and leverage the structure efficiently to get uh, good results. Uh, we also have some results uh, for Infinite Horizon, OPE, and here we're kind of focusing on these uh, double robustness guarantees. So if we think about our data set being just a single trajectory where the length of the trajectory is going to grow, here what's going to happen is that methods like important sampling and, uh, and DR, they're not even going to converge because N is not growing, only T is growing. Uh, and uh, in contrast, our method is going to be consistent whether the Q or W model are right. Um, and this is a simulation setting. And then in a simulation setting for the off policy gradient problem, uh, looking at infinite horizon, uh, we, um, here we're thinking about how fast can we even just estimate a gradient of a fixed data. So fixed data, uh, what's the MSC for estimating the gradient? We have a variety of methods here. Uh, so we have reinforce, uh, we have off pack over here, and then these are different variants of our method. So the green is, is our method, uh, actually, but our uh, efficient influence function derivation actually suggests a variety of other methods that kind of drop some nuisances and keep others. So for example, we can do the method that just uses Q and mu and drops the mu and the Q, or the method that only does um, mu and d mu and drops Q and dq. And this is going to lead to different methods um, that kind of have fewer nuisances but are not efficient. Uh, and we can see that you know doing the efficient thing does the best. But what about learning, which is the target when you're doing policy gradients? Uh, so this is a similar plot by looking at the regret. So here we keep uh, we take many many steps of policy gradient descent and then look at what is the regret at the end. And our method is over here, and it's a little hard to see because some of these methods are really bad. But you know we're going down like one over squared n uh, in, in, in our regret. Um, so I'll end here and I'll just kind of recap uh, what we did here today. Our aim was to overcome these fundamental limits in offline reinforcement learning that kind of made it pretty much impossible to use in practice, essentially this curse of horizon problem. And the idea was to overcome this by leveraging more problem structure. Uh, because without leveraging more problem structure, it appeared to be kind of hopeless. So we looked at what if we actually leverage the fact that we're in an MDP, right? So things are Markovian. What happens if we leverage time invariance, ergodicity? And uh, the theme of what we showed is, well, what's efficient depends on structure. And uh, then essentially, you know, more specifically what we did is we uh, studied the efficiency limits for both off-policy evaluation and off-policy gradient estimation, which are these kind of two key tasks in offline reinforcement learning. And we did this for the first time in the MDP model. And what this gave us is it gave us insight into when does the cursive horizon actually bite? And it showed that it bites if you're going to target uh, non-Markov decision processes, as uh, actually all of these existing estimators did. They actually work in non-Markov decision processes, and therefore they must never work, right? You have to um, assume more in order to, to get past it. And this really painted things as a problem dependent rather than an estimator dependent phenomenon. It wasn't about using a bad estimator or whatever. It's about assuming structure, then seeing what's the most efficient, is the most efficient actually uh, you know, going somewhere fast, and how do we get there, right? And so how do we get there is, well, we provided the first efficient estimators for off policy evaluation, off policy gradients in this MDP model. And these remained efficient even when the nuisances were estimated at slow rates uh, with black box machine learning methods or black box reinforcement learning methods, say. Uh, and they enjoyed certain double robustness guarantees. And we showed that if you do uh, efficient off policy gradient estimation and then try to ascend in the direction of this uh, policy gradient, that's going to lead to some nice learning guarantees. So I will just end here. And thank you again for uh, spending your time uh, listening to my talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nathan. It's right on time. Um, so uh, can we move to Chen Chun? So would you be able to share your slides now? Uh, 
I cannot uh, share my screen. I think I'm, I was made co-host, so I can allow it to you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, try it now. Uh, could, could you see my screen? Yes. Uh, you could, sorry, I just want to say uh, you could put your question on the Q&A um, for, uh, for Nathan and for Chen Chen. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Dr. Song, for uh, the invitation, and uh, thanks, Dr. Kudas, for the very nice talk. And uh, this is Chen Chen Shi. I'm currently an assistant professor of uh, data science at London School of Economics and Political Science. So the rest of the talk today uh, will be mainly focused on discussing uh, Dr. Kula's talk on statistical uh, efficient offline reinforcement learning. And maybe just a, a quick summary of uh, Dr. Kula's talk. So first of all, uh, theoretically, Dr. Kula's de uh, derived some uh, same parametric efficiency bounds for uh, not only for the policy uh, values, but for the policy gradients as well. And uh, in terms of methods, uh, so Dr. Kudas proposed like efficient or policy policy evaluation algorithm, as well as uh, efficient or policy policy grading algorithms for offline reinforcement learning. And finally, also uh, Dr. Kudas conduct some uh, experiments to show the advantage of their proposed algorithms over uh, the classically used or uh, policy evaluation method, as well as uh, the or policy policy gradient algorithm. So next, I would like to uh, briefly summarize uh, the contributions of uh, Dr. Kula's talk. So uh, I think uh, one of the most exciting part of the talk is that uh, it, it, it is the interplay between uh, reinforcement learning and uh, the classical same parametric efficient theory uh, in, in, in statistics. So if we talk about reinforcement learning, so that has been developed like maybe over 30 years uh, in, in the computer science literature. So we have like all those different kinds of reinforcement learning algorithms and uh, th th they can all have like some, some uh, convergence guarantees. But what is less known about those algorithms is that uh, whether the, those alg uh, algorithms, they are efficient in some way or not. And whether they, they enjoy, uh, they have some sort of statistical optimality or not. And given a bunch of algorithms, so if we apply those algorithms to a particular data set, then which algorithm shall we choose uh, on a particular data set? So those, uh, those questions have been less answered uh, in the literature. And while at the same time, uh, if we look at uh, uh, the same parametric efficient theory, so those have also been uh, developed for like maybe, on, maybe for 30, 40 years or even longer time. And, and the reason they, uh, those same parametric efficiency techniques have been popularly applied uh, in causal inference literature in terms of like estimating the average treatment effects with or without like some non measure co-founders. So it is very nice to see uh, the interplay between uh, these two uh, fields and especially uh, it uh, just uh, address the question that I, I have mentioned. So for a particular reinforcement learning algorithm, so can we show like whether it has, it achieves some sort of efficiency, whether it achieves some sort of optimality or not. So this is like one of the uh, first contributions of uh, the, the talk. And secondly, uh, it is um, mainly the uh, efficient of policy policy evaluation algorithm as well as uh, the policy gra uh, gradient algorithm. So as Dr. Kudas uh, mentioned, so especially if we consider uh, the MDP, MDP setting, so with homogeneous Markov transition densities. So those methods break the curse of horizon, so which is typically suffered from uh, the classical uh, OPE or policy gradient algorithms. And because of that, uh, under uh, the MDP setting, they enjoy, they, they, they possess uh, the optimal rate of convergence. So, so in particular, if we think about the data from reinforcement learning, then typically we have like the data consists of like multiple trajectories. So let's say N, N, capital N trajectories. And within each trajectory, suppose like we have like a capital T many decision points. So in total, we have like a total of like N multiplied by T, uh, those many observations. So uh, the optimal rate of convergence is 
uh, under certain conditions should be like uh, uh, the square root of n multiplied by t, by t. But if we use like a classical algorithms, uh, they typically suffer from the curse of horizon. So those of algorithms, they, they, they will usually converge only at a rate of uh, square root of so the square root of n or even at a more slower at a slower rate. So that's in terms of uh, uh, the rate of convergency. And finally, uh, they also achieve the minimum variance uh, among a restricted class of like un unbiased uh, estimators. And this is due to uh, the, 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 due to the fact that it achieves the same parametrically efficient bound. And finally, uh, so I think another contribution is that uh, these methods all uh, are related to offline reinforcement learning problems. So in, in the existing literature, actually, um, many algorithms, they are proposed like under online settings, but uh, that's have been explored uh, in particular in offline settings. But, but for offline set settings, we have like potentially many applications. So Dr. Gulas have also talked one uh, in, in, in medical applications. And, and typically in those applications, uh, the data collection is very expensive. So we really do not have like as much data as what we can get in online settings. So in these settings, it is really important to develop those uh, sample efficient algorithms. So finally, maybe uh, some open uh, questions on, 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 the, uh, on the talk. So I think uh, maybe uh, one of the uh, question is on the challenges on learning those nuisance functions. So in order to derive uh, the, the derive those uh, same parametrically efficient uh, influence function. So for instance, uh, we not only need to learn the Q function, but also uh, in OPE, we will need to learn like the marginal density ratio. And uh, this might be uh, a bit more difficult to learn compared to the Q function. And in terms of uh, the efficient or policy policy gradient, uh, then in addition to learning the marginal density ratio function, we also need to learn like uh, the derivatives of the Q uh, value and, and those mu functions. And they, they might be like even more uh, challenging to, to consistently estimate these functions. And especially in a high dimensional action, uh, state action space. So suppose if we want to use a neural networks to model these functions, then what neural network structures uh, shall we choose? Like how many layers and, and like how many hidden nodes inside each layer? So how shall we tune uh, these particular parameters? Can, can we use some sort of cross validation uh, to, 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 to learn these, these quantities or not? So that's uh, I guess that might be uh, uh, one challenge uh, for implementing lo lo those methods. And the second one is actually not uh, particular to uh, Dr. Kula's proposal on efficient of, po uh, of policy policy gradient algorithm, but it is like a general, it might be a general uh, drawback of, of like more uh, general policy gradient algorithms. So first of all, those algorithms might, uh, might suffer from uh, local op optimality. So uh, the, the, the final uh, policy you estimated might be a locally optimal policy. So since it is only uh, obtained by solving uh, an, an estimating equation to, to, to guarantee that uh, the gradient of the total reward is equal to zero. So, so there, there, there might be uh, some issues here in terms of local op, 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 optimality. And secondly, suppose like, uh, so suppose like the estimated policy is very, very, very close to the optimal policy. So since the optimal policy is usually like a deterministic policy, so it could be like a non-smooth function of, of the uh, state variable. So uh, especially in the case, like if we have like discrete action space. So we are actually using a smooth policy to approximate a, det a deterministic optimal uh, policy. So then when this smooth policy approaches the optimal policy, like will the gradient 
uh, well, its gradient suffer from from some issues. Uh, so this uh, th this might be because like uh, the optimal policy is not a smooth function, so it doesn't have uh, derivatives at all. So if we use a smooth policy to approximate this optimal policy, uh, whether uh, the magnitude of it, like whether the the gradient of this uh, resulting uh, estimated policies, whether it will explode or not. And of course, like uh, we, we, we can restrict the, the parameter space maybe uh, to, to, to say like a compact uh, subspace. But in that case, maybe we are no longer able to uh, consistently estimate the optimal policy. So it will be a policy uh, in, in, in the optimal sense of like with, strict, with uh, re restricting to a, to a compact subspace. Uh, Ching, so, Ching, Ching, should, so these are these are great questions. Should I start answering them? Ah, uh, yeah, sure, please. Thank you. Okay. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for the for the you know very insightful discussion. Thank you for uh, serving as discussing today. Uh, this is really great. These are excellent questions. Let me try, and I mean, these are not like you know questions with answers, but definitely excellent points for discussion. Right. So, thank you so much for raising these. So. Working backwards, I think regarding like the local optimality of policy gradient methods, this is actually an active area of research. So in, in the online setting, there's actually been these really cool recent results uh, from uh, uh, Sham Kakade and some of his uh, colleagues at MSR. I apologize, I don't remember the name, all the names on the, on the paper, but like looking at the, uh, at the global optimality of policy gradient methods. So actually what they show is that policy gradient steps look almost like a policy improvement step. And so under certain conditions, you will actually get a global optimality. So I've actually only recently really delved into the depth of these results. And I think, I hope that actually they, they extend in the offline setting just the same, as long as you have these kind of consistent estimates. Uh, so hopefully actually you can go beyond that, right? Because the way, the thing I mentioned in my slide was kind of this very weak thing of like, oh, assume it's concave then you can say something. Um, uh, but actually, they have some much more powerful machinery that could potentially apply in the offline setting as well. And, and I think it does. Uh, so that is some very exciting work. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in limitation in that kind of stuff, uh, you should definitely uh, look uh, at that work. Uh, that's an ex excellent point. And, you know, it, 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 the fact that this is a very active area of research shows that this is, you know, a really important point. Um, the second point is I'm not sure if it's the magnitude of the gradient or rather it's the variance of a gradient estimator. Because essentially what's gonna happen is, um, is indeed as you approach optimality, you will look more deterministic. And when you look more deterministic, you're, you will look less and less absolutely continuous with respect to the behavior policy. Essentially the density ratios are gonna grow uh, because the, um, no, so this is actually, sorry. So this is only a problem with, with continuous actions. With deterministic actions, sorry, with, with uh, discrete actions, this is actually not gonna be a problem. This is a problem with continuous actions because uh, you're gonna have a, a behavior, the, the target policy is gonna have an atom and the behavior policy is gonna be some density, um, like something uniform over action space. So this is only a problem for, for discrete actions. It's a, this is only a problem for continuous actions. For discrete actions, this actually doesn't arise. Um, like, you just, like, just think about the, the gradient of, of softmax. I mean, that just, the, that's bounded by a quarter. Um, but what happens when you have continuous actions is problematic. Or you can think about continuous actions as essentially like, you know, a very large action space. I mean, those two things are not so distinguishable. In that case, what actually happens is your rate deteriorates from being square root. So you have to think about, you know, doing some smoothing, right? Because if, there, if there's no overlap, you have to do smoothing. And so in a recent paper in, uh, in ICML, no, in NeurIPS, that's, yeah, I don't remember if I think it's, yeah, it's more recent. It's, it's the one in NeurIPS. Uh, we look at, uh, at what happens for deterministic policies with the continuous actions and apply some, uh, um, some smoothness. And actually what's interesting there is the cursor horizon doesn't actually only show up in the constant. It's not just in front of the variance as a two to the T. It actually shows up in the rate. 
if you do things that are like M NMDP, targeting NMDPs, then the cursor horizon is going to hurt your, your, your rate. But if you target the MDP, they won't hurt your rate. So you will be slower than the square root. You'll be like a two fifth instead of a one half. Uh, but you won't have this bad dependence on horizon. Um, I think with the nuisance functions, this is a very interesting question. I think that is where a lot of the future work should be. You know, I kind of glossed over this and said, um, you know, plug something in. Oh, you can use all of these things. But actually thinking about when and how this is feasible is very important. In particular, right, Q, learning Q is more like a regression. But as you said, learning these mu's or w is a bit more complicated. It's still some conditional moment problem, just like regression is a conditional moment problem. Uh, so I think it's possible. With regards to parameter tuning, I think one of the big potentials there is, you know, why can't you do cross validation? Because you don't have a data, the counterfactual data to kind of see what would have happened, right? So you have to estimate, you have to again, estimate it using uh, some sort of important sampling or something like that. Um, but what you could do is you could try and estimate these, uh, these uh, variances and do some trick like optimizing the choice of control variant or optimize the choice of parameter tuning. So this is kind of related to, um, you know, this was a method that people developed in NMDP, something called uh, more robust, W robust, and there's some earlier stuff in causal inference. I think from uh, Marie Davidian, um, I think TAN was involved, something like that, where they essentially estimate the variance, optimize uh, the choice of control variant with respect to the estimated variance. And more recently, uh, Eric Chetkin Chetkin had this paper on how to do this type of thing in the double ML framework. So essentially use this cross-fold estimated stuff to essentially do cross-validation. Uh, so I think there's potential, I mean, I think Eric's method applies uh, directly here. So I think there's potential for using that in practice when you're trying to tune these parameters. Um, I think that's an excellent point. Okay, great. Can we- Thank you uh, so much. Can we Thank start you. some questions on the, Nisa uh, and the Chen Chen, do you wanna look at the chat window maybe? Okay, so uh, Rune, Rune asks, okay, Pi B said, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I see. Oh, Sorry. Yeah, actually, I, I, mean, I, I see like there were some questions there like a moment ago, but uh, when I open the Q and A, oh, it's now, like I. No, it's in the chat. Uh, they asked it in the chat. So one person asked. I'll just read out the question uh, for everybody. As said in the introduction, the data might be collected from, for example, different doctors. Any challenges when extending to data generated by a possibly unknown mixture of a possibly uh, unknown behavior policies. So on um, first I'll say, right, if it's unknown, it doesn't matter. The mixture is just pi b itself. And you don't have to think about the fact that it's a mixture of something else. It's just a distribution. And you just have to estimate that distribution. That said, there might be, there is, I mean, I actually know that there is an interesting phenomenon in the stratified setting. So if, for example, you said, I get 100 data points from this behavior policy, 100 data points from this behavior policy, 100 data points from this behavior policy. So it's not necessarily a mixture of one third, one third, one third, but actually I'm stratifying, fixing, conditioning on the amounts from each one. So I'm conditioning on the fact that a third of the data will come from one behavior policy, a third from another, a third from another. Then you have kind of a stratified sampling phenomenon. And, and, and actually the variance of different estimators is different. Um, uh, so and then actually turns out that there's kind of a dilemma of which estimator to use, but in, 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 the, in the paper that we actually uh, just posted recently on this multiple logger dilemma, it, we showed that the efficient thing remains efficient whether you're stratified or not stratified. So if you plug in, if you estimate these Q functions consistently, um, that's going to be efficient whether or not you're stratified. So it's kind of an interesting uh, phenomenon. Another question that everyone's asked is about OPG. Any challenges in computation to recalculate those nuisance functions every step? Absolutely, right? So kind of the naive thing that I presented was saying, oh, at every theta, re-estimate all these nuisance uh, functions. But even in online uh, RL, when people do policy gradients, they have to re-estimate the Q, the Q function. So what they do in practice is they take a policy step, and then they just take a couple, one or a couple gradient steps to update the Q network. 
So they could totally re-optimize the queue network, but just for practical reasons, you just do like little updates. So I think you could do similar tricks here where you keep a nuisance networks and you just take a few gradient updates to update these nuisance networks uh, for every policy update. Okay, now a question about Omega. I'm not sure what Omega is. Regarding the estimation of Omega. Oh, oh, W. Okay, I called it W. Okay. Could you share more about the difference between how to do tuning and evaluate estimates? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, in Liu et al, what they did is essentially, Liu et al is like a like marginalized importance sampling for, for infinite horizon. Um, and, and that will still fail to be like root and consistent unless uh, these things are essentially parametric, which is I think a really, really tall order for these stationary density ratios, which is like, who knows what these things are, like what kind of structure they have. Uh, so, unless, so if you're gonna estimate the non-parametric, you're gonna get slow rates. So you need to use something that's like orthogonal W robust. Um, and uh, deep GMM is just one way to do this kind of maximum uh, moment uh, minimization. TMDP with some additional domain assumption, do you think we can achieve similar results as MDP? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Um, sorry. <laughs> like if you're making assumptions, I think like these assumptions are essentially means that things are stationary, which means things are like MDP. I guess uh, maybe the third question is on like, like for instance, also uh, the, the density ratio Omega proposed in the OET at all is like slightly different from yours. But uh, maybe uh, is it possible to also use similar ideas like form it into a minimax problem to estimate uh, the, the, the ratio uh, in, 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 your in your proposal? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, that essentially amounts to taking the, like the moment restriction and, and hitting with test functions and taking the soup, which is like what deep GMM does, but with neural networks and shows certain convergence uh, guarantees. Yeah, uh, but it's different because, so I think in Liu et al, it's the ratio between gamma discounted over gamma discounted, but the data, you, but think about it this way, the data you get is, is just trajectories. It's not coming from a gamma discounted distribution. So you should, if you're looking at, you know, the efficient thing, you're changing from uh, from stationary distribution over pi b to a gamma discounted distribution over uh, the target policy. That's why it's that ratio when you do the efficiency analysis. So you would all have like a, it's like inefficient by a factor of gamma kind of thing to, to do the ratio of gamma discounted to gamma discounted instead of gamma discounted to undiscounted. Uh, Dr. Kudos, uh, so I see there's yeah. another question on the chat as well as the Q&A box. Okay, the sample efficiency question. Yeah, so I think, so sample efficiency here is with regards to estimation. It's with regards to estimating whether it's policy value or policy gradient. Uh, and it's, uh, it's with regards to uh, asymptotic rates. It says that um, you get kind of asymptotically or even in finite sample, the leading term in your error bounds will have the minimal constant. Uh, now, in RL, we often talk about like sample complexity of learning. So in that sense, I think it's still an open question to kind of characterize the sample efficiency of off-policy learning. So here I focused on like efficiency questions of estimation, and I showed one implication for learning, but I think being a bit more digging deeper into the learning question and saying, what is efficient? Is this efficient? What would be the best is still somewhat open. 